morning to everybody. Um, I'm supposed to be setting the discussion and provide some of the wider trends on inequality. A lot of the, this work was done in UNICEF, and I always like to start by the distribution of world income. Most of the presentation is focused on income. Um, and uh, this is what we have here, is the global income distribution by countries from 1990 to 2007, so it's an acceptably long series, uh, in PPP constant prices, 2005. And the thing is, um, this is the most conservative assessment you can do. You were looking at that, and no matter that, uh, what you have is a very unequal distribution of income. What you have on top, on top is the top income uh, quintile that will be the richest 20%, and at the bottom, the poorest 20%. And what you can see there is that, um, you know, the, the top income quintile has more than 70% of global income. Um, there are many ways to calculate that, and that will be in constant uh, US dollars, uh, many at market rates instead of adjusted by PPP. And if we do that, actually, we do get much significantly uh, differences in income. In that case, uh, as you can see, the top richest 20% actually has more than 80% of world income, and the poorest has hardly 1%. Uh, one, one uh, it's also interesting to know that the top 1% or 61 million will have the same as the poorest 3.5 billion or approximately half of the world population. Hmm? So the, the figures are very uh, striking, uh, disparities large. And um, there is some sign of progress, if you see, uh, actually the darkest line, the darkest bar reflects uh, 1990 and the lightest bar, the, the most recent data that we had at the time, which it was a just prior to the crisis, 2007, 2008. So it's some sign of improvement, but the problem is the rate. And we estimated that at the current rate of, of progress, it will take about 800 years for the bottom billion, that is the bottom 20%, to achieve 10% of global income. So there is no, no reason to claim victory, no matter there is some progress. These are all different ways to visualize it and calculate it. You have, there are different methodologies. You have them all in the UNICEF paper that is quoted and referenced at the end. Uh, this is about the distribution of world GDP. And uh, this is, uh, follows some work initially done by UNDP in 1989, and to, to which we adapt, uh, you, we updated on the right hand side. Uh, here, what is interesting to note is when this, this figure came up, and that's why we kept the, the UNICEF, uh, sorry, the UNDP uh, first figure, is that if, um, the distribution of world GDP has this shape of a glass, champagne glass. Um, that is, that's an expression uh, by uh, Peter Heller from the IMF. And when he saw it, he says, oh God, it has the shape uh, of champagne glass. And it remains having that shape, as you see with the latest numbers. In 2007, uh, it remains having that shape, more or less. And it focuses the attention that clearly the, the issue is the top, uh, not just 20%, it's the top 10%, really, that seems to, to accrue uh, all the benefits from you know, world income. Now, that figure is also interesting because uh, we were just a number of us at the annual meetings of the bank and the fund in Washington, and as you might be aware, the bank is moving ahead. Uh, now the mission is not only to reduce poverty, but to uh, have shared prosperity. And the notion of shared prosperity at the bank is understood mostly as how much accrues to the, f uh, to the bottom 40% of the population. Now, this is meant to be uh, by country, uh, so it's meant to be for national analysis and not for a global analysis. But if we look here at the global analysis, you'll see that actually um, the bottom 20% uh, is actually the extreme poverty, more or less. That will be the $125 a day. That's what you get in quintal one. And quintal, quintal two is actually the, the, uh, you know, the poverty rate at uh, $2 a day you know, adjusted. 
so d that is, uh, you know, it shows, uh, you know, how, how uh, you know, the, the extent of the bank commission. This is another way of visualizing uh, inequality. And what we have here um, is it's a mix of two things. On the one hand, uh, by countries, and uh, that will be, you know, at the bottom, at the very end, what you have is the richer countries, and at the here, the close end, where you have is poorer countries. And then you have quintals, so it's a way to visualize it too. So at the far left, what you have is the richer quintiles, and at here, closer to us, uh, the poorer quintiles. And what you see is the very, very top uh, bars. They actually reflect the richer quintiles of Luxembourg, United States, and Singapore. You have the numbers there and in the paper. And if you were looking at the poorer, poorer quintiles and countries, what you will have is Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, and Haiti. So uh, this is interesting uh, to visualize uh, income inequality from a global perspective, and we will uh, come back to it at the very end to open the discussion for Richard, because in a way it puts the attention on the importance of you know, international factors too. Not all is about national strategies. These are the, the results. And just to mention and actually praise the excellent work of you and Wider, um, because at one point uh, they did not even they not only launch, uh, you know, data on, on income inequality, they actually uh, worked on wealth inequality for, uh, for some time. And that study on wealth inequality reflected even larger disparities and inequalities than income. And again, most income inequality measures are based a lot on household consumption um, and or wages. And they do not reflect other household wealth, like, such as financial assets or real estate. Uh, these are the typical, uh, you know, uh, instruments that the wealthy will have. So then, you know, disparities become even wider. And again, to focus the attention, we are only talking about income, but inequality, of course, goes across the board in many other, you know, areas, any area really. And this reflects work we also did in UNICEF. And this is about reduc reductions in under five child mortality rate. And this is a country like Namibia. In Namibia will achieve, uh, you know, the MDG goals. Uh, and if you see the aggregate numbers, uh, statistics, you will see that in 1992 had an under five mortality rate of 72. And now, in, well, in 2008 has a rate of 42. So it looked that he has a very progressive and solid path. But however, when you see uh, you know, who is benefiting and who is really doing well in, in, in the under five mortality rate, it shows is the clear bar which represents the, the higher income group. Really, most of the progress of Namibia is due to this higher income group. And the same you could do for many other things. We did, uh, and there's a lot of studies in UNICEF that came out after, you know, the inequality discussion was open, child stunting that comes from India. And again, most of the progress comes because of the improvements uh, in the richest 20%. But when you look at the poorest 20%, they keep doing, you know, not, not so good. In any case, most of the data we had at the time, they were, were up to 2008, to th 2007, 2008, sometimes 2009. So the key question is what has happened with inequality during the crisis and incipient recovery we are experiencing. So following the path actually of, of Andrea Cornia and Richard Jolie and Francis Stewart, when they came with a, the excellent work of adjustment with a human face, we started a new series of work as a recovery with a human face. And we tried to see the social impacts of the current crisis, uh, which were not easy to determine given the, the limited number of data, real-time data on social, on social issues. So here are the main transmission channels of inequality. We know that it had negative impacts on employment and income through a variety of channels. And here, we are here in ILO, so this is not no important, you know, no news for you. Um, they were also an important transmission channel, which it was prices. 
and that means prices of food, uh, agricultural inputs, fuel, medicines, and drugs. All those have negative impacts on households. Also, uh, negative impacts uh, and transmission through assets and credit, meaning lack of access to credit, savings, etc. And then uh, a four main area, it has been government spending on economic and social sectors, particularly after 2010. And we are going to go a bit on detail on those. Um, this is uh, food prices, as we know, we had a main spike in 2008 and then a new one in, in uh, 2011 and prices continue very high. Um, what is more important to know is that prices are sticky and this is not really known why, why is the process, but the international price, once it, reached, it reaches uh, the national economy, actually remains very high at national level. Uh, this comes from a, a FAO series um, of, of local prices, and this is the blue line. And this is very interesting to see that despite you have a, the international price goes down in 2009, at local level, actually, it gets less you know, in parallel. So it remains extremely high. Um, there are a number of suggestions and research going on on why these local prices are sticky, um, um, but it's something very important to observe because of the negative impacts on households, household income. We are again in ILO, so I'm not going to go into this one in detail, uh, but you know we experience a long job crisis. It's not a short one. Uh, certainly the crisis has worsened that, that tendency, with the only exception of Latin America, uh, which has been increasing the demand for labor. Actually, the rest of regions have experienced a long decline since 1990, um, and that is uh, part of the development agenda we are carrying, and we go later. And then something less known, but we have been highlighting very strongly, and the, la and the latest report is the ILO World Social Protection Report that I encourage you to read is that a number of countries uh, are contracting public expenditures. Now, everybody thinks of Europe, but this is much beyond Europe. Actually, in this year, as we are talking, according to IMF fiscal projections, 122 countries are contracting public expenditures, of which 82 are developing countries. So it's not only a European phenomenon, is a, uh, is a policy approach that is happening in many countries. And this is peculiar because uh, during the first crisis of the crisis, uh, on the, the first phase of the crisis, sorry, which 2008, 2009, most countries embarked in fiscal stimulus plans. About, we estimate about 2.4 trillion was spent in fiscal stimulus, of which about 25, a quarter of it, was spent on social protection measures. So from a kind of household point of view, despite the crisis had very negative impacts uh, on employment and on contraction of economic activity, there was a, a response which was positive in the first phase, 2008-2009. Um, the problem comes in 2010 when there's a change of, of, of approach. But before going to that, I wanted to sh showcase a bit uh, the, the policy preference done at the time. And what this represents at uh, this pyramid is how much was invested in bailing out the financial sector in 2009, how much was spent on stimulus plans. And to bail out the financial sector, uh, it's estimated and committed numbers, it was about 11 trillion globally. Uh, fiscal stimulus plans were about 2.4 trillion globally in a number of countries. Then uh, there was a big commitment towards the IMF to invest more in developing countries, but that is only the little tip of the iceberg that you see that is the yellow bit, that it was 0 0.7 trillion, so below, below one, one, 1 trillion. And finally, on green, which you cannot even see, is how much that year was developed in ODA development aid, which it was 0 0.1 trillion. So that, to put things a bit on perspective, and what we see is that the policy uh, solutions of the crisis have prioritized financial sector over socioeconomic recovery, 
this is small graphs, and you have uh, these, these graphs in the world, ILO World Social Protection Report. But what you have first in the big column is how much, again, was committed to the financial, sec to financial sector support, how much was to fiscal stimulus packages, which relatively was few. And that led to a significant increase on gross national debt, 2008-2010. Uh, That's just the increase which now is being uh, passed into populations because they are the ones that through uh, fiscal consolidation and different set of cuts, mostly to uh, things that are, have you know, negative social impacts, uh, do, do impact populations. Um, a number of countries, and going back to the cutting and how this will be affecting inequality, up about a fifth of all world countries are going uh, excessive contraction, and we define that as going below pre crisis expenditure levels, going below pre crisis levels. Um, so it's about a fifth of countries, uh, some of them very markedly. And what are the typical adjustment measures? And we mostly know these through the European uh, discussions, but uh, if we look at all developing countries, and this is an analysis based on 314 IMF country reports. So yes, we spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, the most common me measure used is actually uh, cutting subsidies, reducing subsidies. It go follows by uh, cuts or caps on the wage bill. Uh, then um, this is an, another measure that impacts households is increasing consumption taxes like VAT. Then a number of countries are planning pension reforms, uh, and 47 of them are developing countries, so it's not only a European thing. And very often, uh, what, they are, uh, what is, you see in the IMF country reports is that in, instead of expanding social protection, they talk about very well-targeted safety nets. You see, but a crisis is not the time to target. A crisis is the time to precisely expand the social protection network and not, not to target. And other countries have health and labor reforms. You know, it's a crisis of social support that is expected to increase inequality. So going back to the inequality discussion, if we look at a long series, and this comes from Milanovic at the World Bank that did the phenomenal effort to put this long series, um, starting in 1820. So what we see is inequality has been, uh, you know, increasing over time. And of course, at the main, uh, the, the the most known uh, here work is the one recent work of Piketty, and that is uh, looking at different, uh, a different set of, of data, uh, mostly coming from tax, um, income tax um, records. Um, and this analysis using Piketty data was done by Jomo and Popov in 2013. And this is a very nice article because it links actually uh, the, the evolution of income for the top 10%, 5%, 1%, uh, and links it to different policy measures. And you can see there is a reduction in the, the number of countries that PKT series is used. Uh, there is a reduction since the Russian Revolution towards uh, the, the late 70s. Then there's a transition period since, let's say, the Thatcher-Reagan governments and then a significant increase on inequality since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that means that policies do matter. And um, so there is a change in the type of policies prior to the 1970s and then after the early 80s, uh, that change of policy does create uh, you know, a different set of, of you know, results regarding income. And by now, what it has happened is that the United Nations for long has been actually debating these orthodox policies that have led to an increase in inequality and proposing another agenda, which is what is called the UN Development Agenda, which is for all. And, um, and this is critical to bring equity to, you know, to the development agenda. So what I have tried to do here and in the two columns, what you have in the left column is the traditional orthodox policy advice that was used in the 80s and 90s, um, which some call the Washington Consensus, so we understand. And then the, the emerging, uh, actually the current consensus of a UN development agenda for all that emerges after the 2000s. 
And so typically, and I'm not going to go into detail into that, uh, but uh, the 1980s and 90s were based on growth as a priority through deregulation, de free markets, minimal governments, and very residual social policies. And the UN development agenda for all is, is based mostly on growth and equity through active promotion of national development and somehow integrating economic and social policies. So economic policies attend to the social impacts. And that is critical because part of why income inequality has been growing like that is because of the delinking of macroeconomic policies from any social impact. Hmm? So the macroeconomic policies mostly has focused on inflation and stabilization instead of uh, focusing on real output, output incomes and employment. That will be, you know, a main difference of this agenda. And we have other, uh, you know, aspects which are, uh, I don't know if to go into detail. Um, um, you know, there has been traditionally in the orthodox approach an approach towards fiscal discipline and avoiding a focus on avoiding fiscal deficits. However, there is, a, you know, in the current UN agenda, the development for all is proposed the need of public investments for development and to expand government's fiscal space. That is critical, you know, to, to generate again more output from a, from a social, uh, point of view from the social angle, and again, I'm director of social protection, so I need to put it. <laughs> the, this is this other slide. Uh, the typical uh, orthodox policy advice was always focused on residual <coughs> approaches to social policy. Normally very minimal and always targeted to the poor, very often safety nets. While the new UN development agenda is focused on universal policies, that means for all, and bringing redistribution back to the development agenda. And to give you some examples of that, during the 80s and 90s, it was a big push to, the com to commercialize social services and you know, bring the issues of cost recovery, like fees for services, and in the UN development agenda for all, really we're talking about public services and free when, you know, when possible. And for instance, and let me put you a good example, is the UNICEF school fee abolition initiative that now, you know, widely accepted. Um, on labor issues, uh, very much the orthodox policy advice of the 80s and 90s was focusing on labor flexibility and productivity, mostly through very micro approaches. One nowadays, the, you know, the ILO decent work agenda is more or less acknowledged, you know, in, in global discussions. Um, in terms of social security, a lot of the efforts of the 80s and 90s focused on the privatization of social security, um, mostly pensions through funded pillars and reforms of the welfare systems. While now we are talking about social protection floors for all, that means universal. And a number of countries, already six, are reversing pension privatizations started in the 80s and 90s. Um, we could go on, uh, human rights appear in the discourse on the 80s and 90s, but nothing happens. While well, now in the new agenda, uh, this uh, focus to empower people through rights and standards and um, it keeps on, but you know, a major issue that actually has spillovers, it's at the 80s and 90s, it was no attention whatsoever to political issues, cultural values and sources of conflict because they were considered political issues and not, not interesting. Well, now there's a main focus on conflict prevention, particularly UNDP, and this is an important issue to, to, to highlight. And now these orthodox policies, uh, I mean, it's not just a distinction that we are doing. Uh, you know, they actually aggravated poverty and inequality massively, and these are numbers that come from WHO but you know the, the remarkable work done by Andrea Cornia and his colleagues showed how actually infant mortality rates actually uh, rose significantly for poor segments of society in an uh, extensive number of countries in the 80s and 90s as a result of these policies. So what we find today is the opposite. It's an enormous case for equity. And there are a number of reasons. One is social justice and uh, that is, you know, uh, appearing in, an, in a number of, 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 of claims and protest that people are doing. But uh, critically for us that we are more worried on development, 
And the key issue is that equity actually uh, does contribute to economic growth. And actually, the current uh, concentration of income inequality is very dysfunctional from an economic point of view. Consumption is just focused, it's concentrated on the very, very, you know, uh, top uh, deciles of society and actually is impeding national development. Um, so a main argument <coughs> has been the, the need to make income distribution more equal, so as a way to, to foster, you know, national demand and consumption. And that particularly, um, it is very interesting to see that the evolution of some countries and they pick some Asian countries, Latin American too, um, um, because after 2011, uh, because of the, the world had, you know, the, the depressed demand because of the crisis, many of them, like China, they started changing, doing a policy reversal about income distribution. And China, for instance, they started developing social protection widely, massively, uh, to the point uh, that, you know, is uh, nearly achieving universal pension coverage in, in, you know, in, in a very short time, time frame. Um, so this is a very positive trend and that is followed by a number of countries. And clearly an issue, an important issue is that also equity builds political stability. That is an important issue we need to, you know, to understand. We did a number of work um, showing how inequality slows down economic growth. Here is uh, 94 developing countries. Um, if you, we you know, relate uh, the annual GDP per capita to Gini indices, actually you find that more inequality slows down economic growth. We also uh, found a relation between inequality, violence and crime, and others that I'm not presenting here, but you have all that in the UNICEF study. Uh, the thing is that all this policy, um, policy reversal can lead to an equitable recovery. Um, if we look in the 1929, uh, the financial crash led to a new deal that altered the development model of the day, stimulating economic growth and development, regulating the financial sector, and expanding social security or social protection. And a comparable policy push is needed today and is not too late. And some countries are doing it. Um, how to bring equity to the development agenda, however, will take a bit more than these three elements that we said. And in a way, what we will need is to look at each sector, each investment sector, from agriculture to you know industry, housing, finance, energy, and mining, you name it, and think how will you bring equitable you know, impacts. And so what we have here um, is a summary of um, typical interventions with equitable outcomes and typical interventions with inequitable outcomes. And this is based off about a decade of research, mostly by DFID, the bank, and, main, and several UN agencies on different sector investments. So let me put an example. You know, if you pick agriculture, uh, you could have large investments, uh, perhaps, that only benefit the major landowners. Okay, so you put a lot of money into an irrigation system. Okay, um, very different if you put your investments into food security, land redistribution, and others that will have very equitable impacts. So like that, you could go sector by sector. Let me give another example. In finance, what is, what is very demonstrated effects to have equitable outcomes will be to develop you know, rural banks, branching out to, rural, to local areas, managing finance, fighting illicit financial flows, and typical intervention that will have inequitable or aggressive outcomes will be financial liberalization, rescuing bank systems, uh, which will simply a transfer, direct transfer to large banks or subsidies to large private enterprises. So in all, it will require taking, you know, looking at all these aspects, you know, uh, from all the sectors. So it's, it's not a magic solution to bring equity to the development agenda. It will not happen only because of three interventions or to be too focused. It's actually, it will happen because you are mainstreaming equity across all the different investments that a society has to do. Now, of course, I come from social protection, so this is the commercial. Um, so social protection actually has very, uh, very quick impacts uh, on inequity there, on, sorry, on poverty reduction, they are immediate. If you do a transfer to a household, immediately they reduce poverty. 
but in inequality also, and these are some numbers, and that is a reason why you have a m massive expansion of social protection in a large number of countries today. And this is a very positive phenomenon that is very much welcome. The question that it always comes is, but where is the fiscal space? Well, this is part of the new agenda, and the thing is there is national capacity to fund uh, socioeconomic investments in virtually all countries. There is at least seven options, all supported by the United Nations and by the IFIs, and it goes from reallocating public expenditures uh, to increase tax revenues, fighting illicit financial flows, uh, could be lobbying for aid, though aid is decreasing, tapping into fiscal and foreign exchange reserves, restructuring debt, and adopting more accommod accommodative macroeconomic frameworks. Um, just to finish, um, we are talking here mostly about a national development agenda, but the national development agenda has limit and if limits. And if you look at this figure, you recall is putting countries and income levels. So let's pick that we pick one of the middle uh, middle income countries there. Huh? So what you see, you can do some redistribution from the, the richest quintile to the poorest, but in all, you know, the big disparities are international. So that means that it's very important to address inequality in an international development agenda through, you know, uh, trade, adequate trade arrangements, international finance, and others. Thank you.